Happy Sunday. Good to have you all here. As much as I know you'd enjoy watching me fall backwards over the step behind me, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna move this up. <laughs> That might help. Let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. <laughs> Lord, we, we thank you for this morning, and uh, we thank you for this gathering here. We thank you for uh, bringing back uh, some of our, uh, our dear friends, brother, sister in Christ, who've uh, who've suffered uh, greatly, uh, some trials and, and tribulations. But as always, you, you see each and every one of us through, and uh, we are thankful for your good and perfect plans and purposes uh, for our lives. We uh, thank you that your eye is always on us uh, when we're joyful, when we are sorrowful. Lord, you are with us, and uh, thank you. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your kindness and compassion. Thank you for your power, your strength. Thank you, Lord, for being patient with us. Thank you, Lord, for your holy word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for your truth, which is absolute. Thank you, Lord, for uh, just being here with us. Your presence is known today. Our uh, hearts, uh, Lord, are for you. Uh, may you look upon your people this morning and smile, uh, knowing uh, that we are uh, offering up our worship and praises our thanksgivings to you uh, we wish to glorify and magnify your holy name we uh, are uh, uh, people who are just looking to be equipped to keep on going out uh, into this world with the message the good news that is filled with power uh, the power to transform hearts and lives and we are grateful for it today. May your Holy Spirit uh, guide us through the study of your word that's for us uh, today. Lord, you know where we are. You know what we need. And uh, I pray that you will uh, certainly remove anything uh, that would cause us to not receive your word today. And uh, make clear the path so that we can take it and, uh, and, and receive as you see uh, fit for us this very morning. So... We commit it to you in your name. Amen. Amen. And uh, we were uh, in Romans uh, chapter 1 uh, last week, and we'll be in Romans uh, chapter 1 again this morning. We're not going very far. We're just going to the very next verse. We looked at verses 16 and 17 uh, last week, and we'll be uh, looking at uh, verse 18 this morning, that being the revelation of divine wrath. Uh, in other words, it's the unveiling of God's holy anger. You know, there are words uh, within uh, this Bible uh, that are, you know, for our, our encouragement. Uh, there are words that are for warning. Uh, <laughs> and uh, certainly, uh, I, I think this will be uh, both uh, for us this morning, I hope. So, uh, again, Paul is writing to the believers uh, in the city of Rome, and he says, if we look back at our verses last week, Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 16, 17, and I'm going to include verse 18 this morning, which will be our focus. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For... In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So last Sunday... Uh, I mentioned that Romans is an inspired explanation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul is describing in this book how a person can be right with God. That's the theme of Romans. Be right with God. Be right with others. Be right with yourself. Be right with God. Be right. His thesis is found in verse 16 
what he sets uh, out to prove is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation, as we talked about last week, and as we proclaim as believers, it is the only method whereby a person can be saved. There is no other way. There is no other way. There's only one way to God. Amen? Amen. And we know it. It's the truth. Now, the world may not like the truth, um, but it is the truth nonetheless. And it is a truth that we preach. Uh, it's the good news. Uh, it is a message, and it is a powerful message. Uh, in verse 17, uh, he introduces us to the righteousness which comes from God. And uh, that's the theme uh, that really he develops from um, uh, Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 21, all the way through Romans chapter 5, verse 21. But in verse 18, uh, and in the following verses, is this overwhelming uh, evidence of humankind's sinfulness. So even though the theme of the book of Romans is the righteousness of God, Paul begins in showing us the unrighteousness of men and women, right? So you get the idea that, you know, Paul's trying to underscore how desperately humankind needs the righteousness that only God can provide, right? So first he presents God's case against um, the, uh, the immoral pagans. Uh, is what we find. So in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 through uh, 32, uh, it seems that Paul is speaking about the Gentiles who are just really just, they're sold, they're sold in idolatry and, and various forms of uh, immorality, though he doesn't really mention uh, the Gentiles because the descriptions of the sinner that are found in those verses can apply to all people, Jew and Gentile alike. So uh, that's what we find there. Later on in Romans chapter 2, uh, the beginning of Romans chapter 2 all the way through Romans chapter 3, verse uh, 18, he speaks about how even the religious are guilty before God. That, that while you may not be a Gentile, in fact, you, you may be an outwardly religious Jew, Paul concludes that whoever, whoever you are, Jew, Gentile, whatever you've done, wherever you're from, that all people alike deserve God's judgment. You know, it, Paul's message is that all are guilty before God, before a holy and just and righteous God. Uh, so in a sense, in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, uh, Paul is bringing us into God's uh, courtroom, and he's indicting all mankind. Uh, you know, Jew, Gentile, religious, immoral, pagan, indicting them all as sinners before a holy God. And his goal, as Romans chapter 3, uh, verse 19 tells us, is that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Romans 3, 19, uh, the second part. So in, in light of that, you know, why, why does Paul need to provide... Uh, evidence of humankind's uh, sinfulness. Well, I, I mean, because there are so many who just don't believe that they're that they're sinners, right? You know, it's the same today as it was back in Paul's day. You know, we look around us, and there are just so many who don't even recognize that they're sinners, and it's you know it's, it's the same problem. So a gospel that Paul is presenting, which he claims, as we saw last week is the power of God for salvation. If you believe in it, right, uh, you know, it's really useless and irrelevant to those who don't believe that they're lost in the first place. You know, what, what good is a gospel of power if they don't believe that they're lost, right? You know, uh, you know, uh, you know, if you don't believe it, the gospel is irrelevant because they deny that they are sinners. And uh, we certainly see uh, that today. Uh, in our own day, uh, in our own time. You know, uh, why do you need a gospel to save you if uh, you have no need of being saved, uh, you know, because you're not lost? And, and many feel like they're not lost. Uh, you know, we just think of this very morning. Uh, you know, those whom we passed on our way to this church building this morning, how many are just unaware 
or just reject uh, flat out the idea that they're lost, that they're in need of a savior. So, uh, in order to convince men and women of their need of this gospel of power, uh, Paul needs to convince them in his argument that they're lost. He needs to convince them that they're sinners. He needs to convince them that they're guilty before God and that they're under the wrath of God. So in order to uh, make you see your need of the gospel, you first have to realize that you've done wrong, right? In order to understand the good news, you know, you have to grasp the bad news that before God's holiness, you're guilty. You know, if you don't understand that, if people don't understand that, the gospel's foolishness, right? You know, and it might even be more than foolishness. It might actually be offensive uh, to someone, you know, who doesn't understand that they're guilty, that they've broken God's holy law. And we certainly we find that today, just as Paul found that in, in his day. So, you know, if you or I, if I were to go to someone, you know, and, and sit, if I tell them the good news, I go to someone and I, I tell them, you know, and, and, you know, they don't think they're a sinner, all right? I go to anyone, maybe just a, a neighbor, someone out in the community who doesn't think they're a sinner, and I say, you know what? God loves you. Christ died for you. That's good news. But to them, it sounds like foolishness. Like, what are you talking about? You know, it, it's like saying, you know what? Your, your fine has been paid. Right? Without even knowing that you, you, you know, you, you caused any offense at all. You know, it, it's foolishness. You know, so Paul's saying that you need to understand God's law and you need to understand that you've broken it. You know, if I'm going to someone and telling them about the love of God and that sacrifice of, of love and of grace and of mercy, and they, and they don't understand that they're lost, they don't understand the bad news and they don't grasp it, then... Uh, it just sounds foolish to them. But they need to understand that by breaking it, we need to understand that by breaking it, God's law, that God's angry with you. You know, and God's anger is just. And God's anger is right. And God's anger is perfect. You know, m most people, you know, you go out, you know, just on a regular day, most people uh, think on the whole that they're, you know, they're pretty decent people, Right. Uh, you know, they may not be perfect. They understand that, too. But as, you know, but as far as they're concerned, you know, they haven't done any great wrong, right? Uh, and we encounter that, you know, and since they're not conscious of any real terrible, disastrous sin in their lives, they feel, well, okay, they must be right with God, right? It, you know, God couldn't possibly be angry with them. They haven't done any great wrong, Right? But for Paul, the significant thing is not that people have met their own standards, but rather that people have not met God's standards. And that's what we see here uh, in the book of Romans. Uh, and that's the point that he's trying to get across. The gospel is the choice between life and death. The gospel is the choice between heaven and hell, between God's righteousness provided in Christ and God's wrath uh, for those who reject his righteousness in Jesus. And Paul's reasoning is that is the gospel is going to have any effect. That is, if the gospel of power is going to save people, people first have to know their need of it. And the best way to make them aware of how much they desperately need the gospel is to show them, and he's going to show them, how angry God is with sin and how angry God is with sinners. Uh, it's very logical, uh, and you can see that Paul is just very inspired uh, by the Spirit in, in writing this. He's going to tell them about God's wrath. And uh, so, you know, the, the next question, you know, uh, logically would be, what is God's wrath? Um, well, uh, I, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a Bible school uh, <laughs> definition of God's wrath, okay? So if, if, I'm, if I'm going back and picturing myself in a classroom... Uh, back in Bible college, God's wrath is a settled, determined response of a righteous God against sin. In, in other words, it, it's, you know, God, it, it's, a, it's a steady, it's a steadfast, it's an absolute opposition to all that's evil. That's God's wrath. It, so in the Old Testament, God is presented as a God who loves righteousness and hates wickedness. 
uh, you know, we see that as we, as we read the Old Testament scripture. In Psalm 76, verse 7, Psalm 76, 7, the psalmist says to God, It is you alone who are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? Right? This is the God of the universe. This is the God of all creation. This is Almighty God. In Psalm 90, uh, verses 7 and 8, Moses says, We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. Yeah. Um, you know, I think probably a lot of people have a, a false uh, conception. They feel that they feel that the Old Testament God, they, they separate the two. They feel like the Old Testament God is a God of wrath. And the, you know, the New Testament God, you know, to the contrary, is a God of love who revealed himself in Christ Jesus. Well, of course, God is a God of love, right? And John 3.16 describes God who loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him will never perish but experience eternal, everlasting life. But, and people know that. They know John 3.16, Children know John 3.16. We know John 3.16. And yet, a lot of times we overlook the, you know, toward the end of the chapter there. John chapter 3, verse 36. If you look at John chapter 3, verse 36, we read that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. We can't ignore that. Same chapter. We know John 3.16. How, how much do we know John 3.36? Right? Scripture reveals that God is a God of love. There is no doubt about it. But he's also a God of wrath. He's a God of love. He's a God of wrath. He's a God who has, what did, what did we say? It's a settled, determined, steadfast, absolute opposition to all that's wicked and sinful. Scripture never, ever, ever, we talked about this, Scripture never, ever, ever reveals one attribute of God at the expense of another. Never. You know, and God's love does not at all contradict God's wrath. In fact, it's the opposite. If anything, it complements it. God's wrath is essential for understanding, you know, for a right understanding of his love and for a right understanding of his grace and for a right understanding of his forgiveness, Right? You know, in the gospel, it's all about God's mercy, God's compassion. It's all about God's loving kindness. It's all about his forgiveness. But what is mercy, you know, without that wrath? You know, mercy is absolutely meaningless in relation to justice if there's no such thing as God's anger. Let me give you a dictionary definition of, of, of mercy. Uh, dictionary definition, mercy is simply compassion shown to offenders. That's what it says in the dictionary. Compassion shown to offenders. So you, you, you can't know mercy unless you've offended. I mean, it, it's just simple. So any attempt in some way, you know, in some way to retain a, a, a doctrine of, of divine love, that God loves everyone without a doctrine of divine wrath, it's completely illogical. It's completely, you know, irrational. A God who can't be angry is a God who can't have mercy. Our God is a merciful God. Our God is a God of love, but he's also a God of wrath. And that's okay. It's all right. That's our God. You know, we, we, maybe, you know maybe we, we often think that the opposite of love is wrath. That is not the opposite of love. The opposite of love is hatred, right? It's not wrath. You know, it, it, God's wrath is in complete agreement with his love. If it makes you feel any better when you consider the wrath of God, the anger of God, it's in complete agreement with his love. You know, it, it's essential to the character of God. And for us, I think, I think the idea of God's anger isn't that it's illogical, or maybe not even the fact that it doesn't agree, you know, with God's love. 
It's that it's uncomfortable for us as sinners. We're not perfect, right? We sin. Um, uh, James uh, Montgomery uh, Boyce, uh, he was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, he was the minister of the uh, 10th uh, Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. I think he was uh, from like 1968 all the way until his uh, death in, uh, in the year 2000. But that's a run, right? Uh, but uh, let, let me give you a quote uh, from him. Uh, he said, the wrath of God is not ignoble. Rather, it is too noble. It is too just. It is too perfect. It is this that bothers us, he says. And uh, I, think, uh, I, th I think that's right. You know, it frightens us a, a little bit because the wrath of God is as pure as the holiness of God. And when God is angry, that means that he's perfectly angry. And uh, that's a little frightening, right? That, that means that when he's displeased, that, you know, there's every reason that he should be. And so when his, so that means that when God's displeasure is toward our personal sins, we get uncomfortable. Right, rightly so. We get uncomfortable. You know, it, it's God's anger toward sin. And it's just, and it's perfect, and, uh, you know, it, it, it can make us uncomfortable, and it should. Romans chapter 1, verse 18, says the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. So the verse says it's being revealed from heaven, and since it's revealed from heaven, that means that it's holy, right? It's unveiled from heaven. And so it could, when you look at the language, it can be uh, literally translated as not just, it's constantly revealed. So in being revealed, it's constantly revealed. So the word essentially means to, uh, to uncover something, to make something visible, to make something known. God's wrath revealed, constantly revealed from heaven. Uh, let me give you a couple ways uh, that his uh, wrath is being revealed uh, from heaven. Uh, first, it's revealed in the... Uh, do you want some, my friend? You sure? Uh, it's being uh, revealed in self-inflicted uh, consequences of sin, which is hard. A lot of times we bring things uh, upon ourselves. The, the context of this chapter, and we'll see this, uh, Lord willing, uh, in the weeks to come, uh, it, it is where God's word is speaking directly to those in immorality. So in verse 24, uh, if, you, if you were to look down a little bit, Romans chapter 1, uh, and we won't read it, but if you look at verse 24, we see that some of the self-inflicted consequences of sin for these pagans was that God gave them over to their uncleanness. He gave them over to moral depravity, uh, you know, to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies uh, among themselves. If you look at verse 26 of Romans chapter 1, we see uh, there's another self-inflicted consequence, that God gave them over to their shameful lusts, we read in verse 26. You look down at verse 28, you see yet another self-inflicted consequence of sin that God gave them over to uh, a depraved mind, you see in verse 28. In other words, he gave them over to a, a worthless mindset to break all the rules of, of proper conduct. Uh, if you look back at verse 27, we read that there was a physical consequence, you know, receiving in their own bodies that inevitable and uh, appropriate penalty for the wrongdoing it, you know it, th this is the law of sowing and reaping th that's what we see here it, it's a natural consequence of violating God's universal moral law if you sin against God you know you'll reap a whirlwind right you know the, the law of the harvest it dictates that when a person what a person sows uh, he or she will also reap because God the Bible says is not uh, to be mocked. Uh, he won't be. Uh, so are you, you know, the, we, we ask ourselves, uh, you know, are, are you sowing sin, you know, before a holy God? 
we see many people doing it. You know, I, I've, said, I've said it over the course of these many weeks. We see people we love doing it, and it breaks our hearts. You know, because we want them to know the saving power of the gospel. And they keep rejecting it or considering it as foolishness. And, you know, they're doing this before a holy and just God. He's God of love, but he's God of wrath. You know, our... You know, and we see people reaping these self-inflicted consequences. We understand it ourselves because sometimes we, we do it to ourselves. You know, it, it, could, it could take so many forms, but it, it's really to understand what the wise man was saying there in Proverbs uh, chapter 13, verse 15. If you look at the second part of uh, Proverbs 13, 15, reading from the Amplified, the way of the unfaithful is hard, like barren, dry soil the way of the unfaithful it is hard you know and it, th there are so many people that they're, they're just reaping that way every step of their lives and it's so hard like like dry like like barren soil you know because of what because of what we're seeing in verse 24 and verse 26 and verse 28 of romans chapter 1 it's that self-inflicted consequence of sin and maybe we remember you know when, when sin was the habit of our lives before we knew the Lord. Um, and then times where we just stumble back into those personal sins and recognize those self-inflicted consequences. Now, that's, now that's, that's indirect, but it, it's true that God occasionally, and we see this within the Word, God occasionally just breaks through into human history. God breaks through into human experience to show his extreme displeasure at humankind's sin, right? Genesis chapter 6, you know what happens in Genesis 6. Genesis 6 tells us that the wickedness of the human race that had become just so great that the people imagined evil continually. Can you imagine that? The people just imagined it. They were conjuring it up in their minds continually from morning to night. And God said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I've created. And in Genesis chapter 6, he sent a flood, right? In Genesis chapter 19, we have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and, and many of the features that we see here in Romans chapter 1 were there also in that very chapter. You know? And again, God, in a very graphic sense, what does he do? He sent fire and brimstone upon those cities in judgment because their sin had just... Their sin was so great that it had reached its stench, you know, to heaven. And God is just and God is holy and he will not have it, right? And, and th those are self-inflicted consequences of sin. And there are self-inflicted consequences of sin that we reap in everyday personal experiences. And then there are these direct interventions of God that we have there in Old Testament history uh, but the most graphic revelation, and we've seen this recently, the most graphic revelation of God's holy wrath against sin was what? Was when he poured out that, that cup of wrath, right? Was when he poured it out upon his one and his only and his precious and beloved and begotten son. And he did so in divine judgment at the cross. So if you want to know where God's wrath has been revealed from heaven... Where can we look? But to the cross. To the cross. The psalmist, uh, the psalmist said uh, prophetically, uh, speaking of Christ, Psalm 88, verse 7. Psalm 88, 7. Your wrath lies heavily on me. You have overwhelmed me with all your waves. And that's what it was like for Christ. That's what it was for Christ. His, his father you know, and just the wrath that was poured upon him there. When we look at the cross, we see the most violent, and I would say the most mysterious outpouring of God's wrath. It's, it's wonderful when we believe in Christ and when we put our trust and we put our faith in Christ and Christ uh, alone and, uh, and we appropriate his righteousness that he gives freely to those who trust in him. But, but, if you're not a believer, you know, if you're separated, if you're estranged from God's forgiveness, then the cross, more than anything, is just a terrible uh, warning to the unrepentant. 
you know, to those who refuse to repent and refuse to believe, what a warning it is. Because if God didn't spare his own son, on whom was laid the sins of others, because he wasn't dying for his own sins, right? We know that. Our Christ was not dying for his own. He was sinless. He was pure, right? He's taking our sins as his own. If God didn't spare his own son, in those circumstances, will he spare sinners whose sins are their own? Where's God's holy anger? You know, it, it's seen in everyday life in the circumstances where you, where you reap what you sow in sin. And, and, and it's seen in some, sometimes it's seen in some, you know, as we see in Genesis chapter 6, you know, and, and in, out there, through Old Testament history, in some cataclysmic divine interventions of God in history, particularly in the Old Testament, I would say. You know, uh, it's seen at Calvary, where Jesus is dying, where Jesus... The Holy Son of God is exhausting the wrath of God because he loves sinners. There's no greater love. But friends, uh, we should note that in Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 18, it says that the wrath of God is, again, it's being revealed from heaven. It's being constantly revealed from heaven. But look at that. That's present tense. It's present. That means that it's being revealed now. Constantly revealed. People often... I think even us sometimes, we, we project God's wrath to a future day, right? You know, when we consider God's wrath, God's judgment, we're thinking about that, you know, the last judgment. You know, we're thinking of book of Revelation. You know, the, the, the books are opened and, and all that is absolutely true. No doubt. But at the same time, have we ever thought about how God's wrath is being constantly revealed now, today, in this time and in this moment? Because it is. It is. Uh, Matthew Henry, I don't believe I have quoted from Matthew Henry in quite some time. But if you've ever uh, read through the commentaries of Matthew Henry, he put it like this. As God's mercies are new every morning towards his people, so his anger is new every morning against the wicked. I think that's true. It's constantly being revealed. The psalmist said, Psalm 7, verse 11. Psalm 7, verse 11, God is a righteous judge, a God who displays his wrath every day. Constantly reveals his wrath every day. You know, so what does that mean? It means that if, if you're not clothed in the righteousness of God, if you're not clothed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus, our Lord, then God's wrath abides on you. Now, presently, you know, it, it, it's not just the future wrath and judgment. This is something that's now, present tense. God is angry with those who reject him now. God is angry with those who are not clothed in, clothed in the righteousness of Christ now. But, 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 the good news of the gospel, I, I, you know, I, I can't leave it there, right? We, we know the other part of this. The good news of the gospel is that the good news is also in the present tense. Good. Praise God. You know, going back to Romans chapter 1, verse 17. If you look at it again, Paul speaks of the righteousness of God revealed from faith, from first to last, from faith to faith. That is present tense. That's good news. God's salvation can clothe us to make us worthy in God's eyes to come into his presence, and it's being revealed now. It's being revealed presently. In other words, those whom we love can have it now. Our neighbors can have it now. Our colleagues at work can have it now, right? We can have it now if we're not truly for him, you know, and God knows our hearts. But we can have it. We can have it. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, God demonstrates his love toward us. He reveals his love in that. And it's just utterly astounding that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's also in the present tense. God is still communicating his love through the cross now, presently. That's a gospel of power. That's good news. 
That's the message we're carrying out to the world. It's constantly being revealed in the gospel. Constantly. And that's why we still see people coming to Christ. I know the world is awful. I know the world is dark. I know there are terrible things happening all around us. But people are still coming to Christ because of the good news of the gospel. Do you believe that? If we don't believe it, then why would we even bother trying to carry it out into the world? There are people who are lost, and there are people who are dying, and there are people who are rejecting and, and refusing the Lord, but there is power in the gospel. We have to keep proclaiming the good news. We talked about where God's uh, anger is. We talked about what it is, and uh, we should talk a little bit about why uh, it is. Uh, we don't want to be doubtful that we deserve God's wrath. Uh, Romans chapter 1 verse 18 shows us that God's wrath is vented against uh, really if you look at it there's two aspects of sin uh, that are being spoken of there uh, that that ungodliness uh, that lives uh, in hearts and, uh, and and evil actions and God has revealed his wrath against those two things um, so we uh, need to take a, a look at that uh, just a little bit. Uh, so let's, if we look at ungodliness, um, it's that sin that's against God. Um, so, you know, it's a lack of, of reverence to God. It's a lack of devotion to God. It's a lack of worship to the true God. It's, a, it's having... Uh, it's having a defective relationship with God, uh, that godlessness, right? There's something wrong. There's something wrong. You know, it, it may be that someone disregards uh, his existence, or it may be just a refusal to, uh, uh, to retain the knowledge of God uh, in your mind or, or in your heart. You, in other words... You believe he's there, God's there, but you, you don't really want to think about him. You don't want to answer to him. And I, I think that actually defines a great many people. You know, he's there, but I really don't want to have too much to do with him, right? You know, and then we also see uh, in there the word uh, wickedness. It's the godlessness. It's that ungodliness. But then we see the, that wickedness. Is that second word? And I mean, obviously, you look out into the world and you see wickedness because wickedness is is sin against others, and we see too much of that. Um, the sad thing is, is that wickedness is the result of godlessness. Wickedness is the result of ungodliness. If you, in other words, if, if you have a defective relationship with God, if you don't have a right relationship with God, godlessness, then you won't have a right relationship with anyone else, with mankind, wickedness, right? You know, in other words, there's a lack of conformity in your thoughts. There's a lack of conformity in your words and in your actions and deeds to the character and the law of God. You know, it's the condition of not being right with God or with others according to God's standards, but even at times, not even according to the standards of humankind, you know. But the point is that sin, whatever kind it may be, whatever, you know, it, the Bible's very clear that it will not go unpunished, whether it's against God whether it's against humankind, ungodliness, or wickedness, though, you know, these two cover both sides, both tables of the law. You know, uh, what are the first five commandments? You know, now, now, the, now, now we're scrambling to remember the Ten Commandments. I'm cheating. I wrote them down. All right? But, you know, uh, I, what's our duty toward God, right? The first five commandments, our duty toward the God of the universe. No other gods before the living God. No images. Do not take the name of the Lord in vain. Remember the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother. And the next are toward others. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. Godward, 
and man word. The commandments, the law, right? And God is angry at the transgressions of his law, no matter what form they take. All, all ungodliness, all wickedness, no exceptions, nothing overlooked, nothing. In other words, we, we can't say that God doesn't mind some evils, you know, like he turns his back on some evils, right? You know, he, he doesn't mind this form of wickedness. He doesn't mind this form of ungodliness. No, no, no. That's not the case at all. He's angry toward them all. All of them. No exception. And, and, and then we see that he, he's also angry against those, if you look at verse 18 again, he's angry at those who suppress the truth in their wickedness. And, and these are people who know the truth about God. And we're going to see... When we look at Romans chapter 1, verse 19, all the way in through uh, Romans chapter 2, that in, in, in conscience, people know God. They know. And God has written his law on their hearts so that we know the difference between right and wrong. Right? In, in creation, we see that you know, God's handiwork is just written across uh, all, uh, you know, the, the whole universe, really. But, you know... Uh, also in God's word, the revelation of himself, the revelation of his one and only son, the revelation there, and, and the scriptures, it, it's irrefutable. And yet at the same time, all of that said, there are those who resist it. There are those who resist it, those who oppose God's truth, holding on to their sin, hold, not only just holding on to it, but holding tightly on to it. They don't allow God's truth to work in their lives. And uh, like the psalmist says in Psalm 14, Verse 1, Psalm 14, 1, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. I, you know, uh, there are people saying that this morning. There is no God, right? You know, the word for fool, uh, Psalm 14, 1, the, the word for fool comes from a Hebrew word meaning withering. You know, so if we make no room for God, what does it mean? It means we have just that. We have withered hearts. And our moral sense of righteousness is just, it's put down, it's put to sleep. And the, all the noble aspirations of the, of the heart, they just wither. They shrivel up and die. So, you, we don't... Absolutely, you don't want to be a person who suppresses God's truth in your life in order to just live your life the way that you want. You know, we, we again, we see people do this. You know, we, we see people that do this in order to avoid the, uh, um, to avoid the conviction that comes from knowing God's truth. Look, I, I think we could easily slip into that sometimes, you know, where we just want to live life the way we want to live it. And, uh, you know, and there's the danger of suppressing the truth of who God is, you know. And, uh, boy, it would be great to avoid all that conviction of knowing God's truth, but that we can't do that. We know who God is. We know that there's a God. We know that he's a God of love, but we also know that he's a God of wrath. You know, we know these things. You know, well, how do you know? Uh, you know, you might say, well, you know, I, I want to make sure that I haven't done this. How do you know if you've done it, if, if you've suppressed the truth? Well, I mean, the Bible sometimes speaks of it too, and, and, and preachers will speak of that still small voice, right? That voice of conscience that speaks to you and that speaks to me about wrong. And if we disregard that voice, if we, if we disregard it, then, you know, then what, what do you think God's going to do? God will be angry. God's wrath, because he does not like any form of, of wickedness and ungodliness, he is perfectly just to be displeased with us. If that's us. So, and that, you know, what happens, if you, what happens if you hear that voice and, and you don't just discard it, but you just, you, you, you just outright thwart it, 
right? You, you try to do away with it completely, you know? You, you just won't hear it. Well, then eventually, you know, the next phase is that, that that conscience becomes just systematically just deadened and seared and, and sterilized and the truth of God, which God left with you and, and left in you, it's just, it's completely obstructed until you get to that point and you get to that position where you hardly know right from wrong, where you hardly know good from evil. You know, we see evil and wickedness in this world and we see a people who just don't know anymore. They've, they've shut that, that's, that voice uh, down completely and that they hardly know the difference. You know, uh, what happens is you, your understanding just becomes dead, it becomes darkened, and you're alienated from God, and that wrath of God is upon you. And we see the wrath of God upon many. If you're a person who's known God's truth and then you've suppressed that God's influence in your life, you know, you, you can suppress his truth now, but the day of God is coming soon. I, I have no idea, you know, but I know it's coming. The, the, the essence of God and the administration of his wrath is, is, is basically it's giving sinners what they choose. If sinners choose this, God will give them over to it. It's what it says here. You know, God will just give them over. You know, we see in the, the, the verses there, 24 and, and 26 and 28 and so on. He'll give them over to their shameful lusts. He'll give them over to their depraved mind. You know, he'll, he'll do it if that's what they want. You know, if they choose that, you know, then, you know, he's, he's, he's giving them what they choose. Nothing more, nothing less. You know, we don't want to choose God's wrath over God's righteousness. We always want to choose God's righteousness in faith in Jesus. That's that's what we're called to do. You know, friends, we have a we have a powerful uh, message to keep carrying out to this world. Remember, the good news is being revealed presently. It's something that not only we but everyone can have now. But surely God's wrath is being revealed, that divine wrath, which is just, which is perfect, and uh, which is in agreement with his love and his mercy. It's being revealed now as well. And it's why all the more we have to keep proclaiming the good news. It's why all the more we have to keep standing upon the truth. Don't suppress it, you know. Don't, don't give in to, uh, you know, listen, listen we're, we're fighting against the flesh and the devil and this world, I know. And the temptation would be just to live for ourselves, right? And ignore the voice and ignore what God's calling us to be and to do within our hearts, right? Uh, but we, we, we can't give in. We have to stand strong. Uh, we have to uh, keep on believing in this gospel of power. It's transformed our lives. It's, it's turned our hearts around. We're believers, right? We're, what, what do we say on Easter morning? We're, we're, we're the children of God. We're children of the light. We're children of the day. And we still are. And we, we need to live like that. Keep living like that. People are going to look at you and, and know that you belong to him. This, this wonderful God, this almighty God. Let the word of God, let the truth keep changing you and transforming you and sanctifying you, separating you from everything else, right? Be a peculiar person, right? <laughs> you know, let this ex extraordinary love just uh, keep on uh, you know, blossoming within your heart. And uh, hopefully we'll see that, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we're going to see others uh, come to know Jesus as well. I come to see more lives transformed. Don't give up hope. You're looking around. You see neighbors. You see colleagues. You see loved ones within your families. And they don't believe. And they reject. And they resist. And they thwart the idea of God. Don't give up hope. Keep praying for them. You know. Keep. God hears you. And uh, there's power in, the, in this truth. And in this gospel. Don't give up. You know. God's love, God's mercy, God's grace does amazing things, you know, 
God's wrath is real, uh, but his mercy and his love is real, and they're in agreement. We're going to keep on carrying this message. I, I could keep going, but I'm going to, but let's, uh, but let's pray uh, this morning. Lord, I, okay, <laughs> Lord, your word, your word is the truth, and it, I think it does, I, it is frightening, Lord, to know that when you're, you're displeased with us because of whatever our personal sins are, uh, you know, these are sins, Lord, that we, I, you know, d dare we call them secret sins. It's just those things that we don't broadcast, you know, it, it's those things that, you know, maybe, you know, it, it, people just don't see, you know, in us. They, they maybe see us on Sunday, you know, here in this building or, you know, or you know, out in the community, but, you know, there's, we're not perfect. There's things that we do, there's things that we say, our deeds, our words that are, there's things that are sinful. Uh, you know, it may not be a habit, you know, maybe it is, and we fall back into it. Uh, we know at times it creates just, uh, uh, it, you know, this obstacle, you know, we're starting to create this obstruction, you know, um, and we know that we're just not right. Uh, you know, your word here is about being right, <laughs> being right. And I, I, it's your power, it's your strength that fills us and is going to make us right. You know, we, we need to keep trusting and, and, and believing in you. And it is frightening to know that when we're not right and, and you're displeased with us, you know, that it's, it's justified. You know, that your, your, your justice, your righteousness, your anger is perfect. When you're displeased with us, it's because we just, you know, we, you know, we, we deserve it. Um, that's hard. You know, we can understand. Um, and I, I just, you know, I pray, Lord, that as we go through our days and as we, you know, we, we look around us and we see uh, people whom we, whom we love, maybe, just, maybe they're just people we're just acquainted with, you know, but still, you know, your light in us, your love in us makes us just, you know, long to just reach out with the gospel. I hope so. You know, Lord, please help us. You know, we don't, we can't deny who you are and what you've done and what you will do. We, we can't deny your existence and your power and your love and, and all of this, Lord. We can't, you know, uh, you know, we, we can't just like join in, you know, with the rest of the world and say, this, this looks good. Let's, let's just live our lives the way we want to. You know, let's, let's, uh, you know, why, why keep having to deal with the conviction? You know, let's, let's live it up. Let's give in to those uh, desires. Let's, let's give in to whatever, you know, our, we can't do that. It, it just leads us to destruction. We have to know that. You know, we see others just walking those paths. Maybe some of them are just running headlong down those paths and we know where it ends. And it, it, how can we not just continue to reach out in love? Lord, empower us and give us the courage and the strength to keep on going. This is a gospel of power and it's the power for salvation. And there is no other way no matter what anyone says, there's no other way except through Christ Jesus, our Lord. That's the only way. He is the way and the truth. He is the life. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we have to keep pointing others. We have to keep uh, proclaiming the good news. Um, and we ourselves have to hold on to it. We have to. Um, it's so important. Uh, so uh, we, we give all of this to you. And uh, it's a hard word, but it's a good word for us. Uh, may it encourage us. Uh, may it help us to endure. And may it help us to be uh, ever more reliant upon your strength and your love. 
uh, as we uh, continue on this uh, journey and this pilgrimage that you've set us on. Uh, we, uh, we thank you for all that, all that you are. Your character, thank you that it's unchanging. Thank you that there are no contradictions. Uh, we, we believe what the word of God says. And we will continue to stand on it. Help us to fix our eyes on you in these days. Uh, we, uh, we trust in you and we love you. Uh, amen.